Uh, Mick has um, a fantastic foundation, the Not Impossible Foundation, and more importantly, the Not Impossible Labs. Obviously, he doesn't believe that anything's impossible, and if you haven't, you should look up his TED Talk on his first project, which was the iWriter. He has a company in Venice that works in the film business, and they did the opening title sequences for James Bond's Quantum of Solace. He also, the current project he's going to talk to you about today is Project Daniel, and that was featured on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, and it won five Lion Awards recently at the Cannes Film Festival. So please give a big welcome to the guy that drove all night to get to you, Mick Ebeling. Hello. All right. Um, this is going to be a study in brain activity. It's going to last about 27 minutes, and then I'm just going to collapse, and they're going to wheel me <laughs> off the stage. Um, so uh, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk about two projects. I'm going to talk about kind of the first thing that got me into doing this and what essentially launched Non Impossible, uh, which is the iWriter. And then I'll talk about Project Daniel, and we'll fly through that. But my favorite thing at these talks is more the q and I'd like to stop hearing myself talk in about 20 minutes or so and hopefully have you guys give, just pepper me with questions because that's the fun stuff and we can talk about some of the other things we're working on or any questions you have about the current projects. Um, so the philosophy of Non-Impossible Labs is, um, is this concept of technology for the sake of humanity. And what that means for us is we don't believe in what traditional society would call IP. We believe that you can take anything, you can hack it, crack it open, modify it, take the things that you have, and turn it into something that accomplishes a fundamental social need. That's what technology for the sake of humanity is. Uh, the way that we tell our stories, and I'll talk a little bit about why the concept of story is so important, is through this lens of help one, help many. If I ask everybody in this room right now, who here wants to help me solve world hunger? I think. Most of you would go, yeah, yeah. Your voice is like, yeah, how was the date last night? It was good, you know? <laughs> she was, she or he was nice. That's that octave that goes up, right? If I say, hey, Jim needs to eat. You want to help me? Yes. It's quantifiable. It's singular. You can say yes, you can say yes to one. And what we do is everything that we create, we publish open source. Open source is a two-word a two definition of the word free. We give it away. And if there's something that I've learned over the last, since 2008, like the, the ultimate Excalibur is this concept of free. When you give things away, it cuts through anything and everything. So we create things and then we give it away. And we create things and we give it away. And when we do, when we release it, it's never, it's never perfect. What we make is not necessarily pretty all the time. But what happens is people then can take what we've done and they can increase it and make it better and improve upon it. And we actually like that. That's what we want. Uh, so it started with this guy. This guy is named Tempt. And Tempt in the 80s and 90s was one of the foremost graffiti artists. And he came home from a run one day, and he said to his dad, uh, Dad, my, my legs are tingling. And that was the onset of Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. And uh, so my, as Joseph was saying, I, I have a, a production company. And we decided that we were going to, instead of giving our clients a bottle of wine that they would forget about the next day, that we were going to give them, we're going to make a donation to a charity on their behalf. So we picked Temp's charity. I went and met with his father and brother who ran the charity and said, hey, we got this money, we're going to give it to you. What are we going to use it for? And his brother said, I just want to talk to my brother again. And I said, what do you mean? He's, I mean, I know he's paralyzed, but I've seen the videos of Stephen Hawking and Christopher Reeves, and you know, I've, I know that there's that, that thing that talks like this that, that, pe that paralyzed people or people with trachs would actually use. And he said, no, no, no it doesn't work like that. You have to have insurance or money. We have neither. And I said, then how do you talk to him now? And he said, through a piece of paper. We talk with a piece of paper. So we hold up a piece of paper, and that piece of paper has the alphabet on it, and we run our finger along it, and when he gets to a letter, he blinks, and then we write that down, and then we start again, and we start again, and we start again, and we start again. Well, the cruel joke about ALS is that you're paralyzed, but you also have full sensory uh, feeling. So you can feel a cramp, you can feel heat, you can feel cold, you can feel pain. 
So if you're cramped and you want to say, my leg is cramping, and, and your brother happens to mess that up while he's trying to translate the letters, it's a painful process. So when he explained this to me, I was like, well, wait a second. There's this movie that I saw. There's this book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. You guys familiar with that? Beautiful, beautiful film. Here's the rub. That was in 2008. I don't know if any of y'all from technology, but 13 years is about three centuries in the world of technology, right? 13 years is a very, very long time. So I was like, all right, well, we, that doesn't work. We're not going to just accept that. So my process and the process that we, that we abide by at Non Impossible Labs is you commit, and then you figure out how you're going to do it. So I said, all right, that's BS. Two things. We're going to get tempt one of those Stephen Hawking machines. And then, you know what? I'm going to double down. We're going to get him a device that lets him draw again. And his father and brother said, really? You can do that? I'm like, damn straight. We're going to do that. He said, really? I'm like, yeah. High five, hugs, walk out the door. I'm like, oh, my God, what did I just commit to? <laughs> what did I just commit to? Because I had no idea what I was going to do. But in my world, if you see that something has been made possible before, then making it possible in another realm. That's kind of the way I do it. And, and the perfect example of this for me is, um, anyone know the name Roger Bannister? Roger Bannister was the first person in all of recorded history, all of recorded history to break the four-minute mile. He broke the four-minute mile. 75 days later, two more people broke the four-minute mile. All of recorded history and then 75 days, right? What does that tell you? Once you break the impossible, then it kind of like gives permission to everyone else to break the impossible. So my process is, and this room is a perfect example, is I love to surround myself with people that make me feel stupid. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm at the dinner party and I'm the dumbest guy at the table, the smartest guy is the loser and I'm the winner. Because <laughs> I get to sit there and just like suck in everything he or she is saying, and they just get to look at me like this, going, well, tell me more and ask more questions, right? So what I do is I like to surround myself with people that are brilliant. So I invited programmers from around the world, hackers from around the world, flew to my house, took things off the wall, pressed all the couches and took them outside or took them and pushed them inside, put in some card tables, and we just started to hack. And we hacked away and we came up with this, a device called the iRider. And I live in Venice Beach, so the iRider is a pair of cheap glasses from the Venice Beach boardwalk, um, a, a copper wire that's sin since been replaced by a better material called a coat hanger because it's stronger, lighter, and cheaper. <laughs> a Sony PS3 camera. And what it does is it tracks your pupil. So what it does is if you, everyone sit and look at the screen and keep your head perfectly still as if you were tempt. And now with the tent center of your eye, draw the first letter of your name. And then when you get to the end of the letter, blink and that picks the pencil up. And then blink again, and that puts it down. And that's called, that's called blink engaged, right? So that's what we created. Uh, and this is a video that talks a little bit about it. Tempt is the ultimate graffiti artist. He's put Los Angeles on the map. He's always been next level. He probably is the most versatile artist. Tempt is an innovator. People respect him, they know who he is. He's an OG. He's such a force. Nobody compares with his style. He's one of the top five in the world. Him being laid up, I don't think about that. When you get diagnosed with ALS, it's a traumatizing experience because you're told you have only so long to live and you will spend your time completely trapped inside a body that doesn't move anymore. I hate seeing him like that. There's so many times where he could have just slipped away, but he's sticking it in there. It's all about that one phone call. Phone call that I almost did not pick up. Nick Eveline was on the other end. I had to be involved with Tempt and just helping him. I had no idea how I was going to come through on, on what I committed to. Um. culture was born of making something from nothing. I laid in bed, exploding with ideas that branched out from that initial concept. That's when I knew I wasn't done yet. So, 
So that's, that's getting up. So we ended up documenting it. And funny enough, you know the saying of children's, uh, the shoemaker's children go without shoes? It was a week before or two weeks before all the guys showed up at our house to hack. And we're out to dinner and friends of ours said, so you're going to shoot and document this, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we've got to get uh, camera people over here for this thing. It's like, crap, I've been working so hard, I'm going to think. So in the end, this is what it looked like. Um, cheap sunglasses, duct tape. If, if literally, if the... Armageddon comes, you want duct tape and zip ties. Those are the two things you need, because that can <laughs> truly, that can solve any problem. So <clears throat> we, we made this, uh, and this is actually what Temp looked like the very, very, very first time he drew with his eyes, which was, which was pretty awesome to see. And this is kind of rudimentary scrawl, but he has since made the most incredible art with his eyes. I have full use of my hands, and I can't make the stuff that he makes. So we basically, uh, we went and we did this and we set up a projector outside of his hospital room. We beamed a light or beamed a signal down to the, to the parking lot, shined it on a wall, and he drew again for the first time in seven years. And his family was there and his friends were there and everybody was there. And I invited my, my brother down and I was just, it was just this amazing, amazing experience. And that was it. Like we all went out afterwards and celebrated and, and it was just like this incredible glow of energy. And then we went to bed. And then we, quote, woke up the next day, and it was Time Magazine's top 50 inventions of 2010. And Gizmodo called it Eight Incredible Health Inventions That Transform Lives. It's now part of the permanent collection at the MoMA. And the press went crazy. Uh, I got to do a TED Talk, which was a bucket list. And, and all of this stuff is just going crazy. And we're like, what the hell is going on? We just wanted to help this friend of ours. But I would go and I would give these talks, and people would say, so what's next? And I'm like, that's not enough? <laughs> and it kept being asked over and over and over again. That's why when you guys ask today, what's next, I have, I'm prepared for you today, right? <laughs> and so it started to cause us to think, what is next? And how can we take, how can we learn what we learned from this experience and try to replicate it? And so we're going through this process, and then Temp sent us this email. And he said, that was the first time I'd drawn anything for seven years. I feel like I'd been held underwater, and someone finally reached down and pulled my head up so I could take a breath. And we're like, all right, we're going to figure out how to do this again. You know? Like, that's the, any football fans, that's like the banner over the locker room that you tap as you walk out of the house every day. And we're like, we got we to do this. So the crazy thing about this is... Tempt ALS has since then progressed, and Tempt has lost his ability. If everyone in this room blink three times intentionally, can you feel those muscles in your eyes? Now, you've blinked or blunked. Is that what you say in Texas? <laughs> blunk, blunked, That's blunked. It. You got it right. You ran the Texas game. Yeah, so you've done blunked about a thousand times while you're sitting here today, right? We're blunking. We're blunking as we speak. But to blink intentionally takes muscular activity, and Temp lost his ability to blink, thus losing his ability to draw. So we're like, no, 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 no. So what do we do? We said, we're going to figure out a way to get that back. Um, and about three weeks ago, we launched the first edition of the next edition of the iWriter, and it's called the Brain Writer. And what we've done is we've now taken the action, the binary action, which is essentially if you're, a, if you're a graphic artist, you know, when you have a stylus on a thing, you, you click it, or a, just a, an artist, you put the paintbrush down, whatever. That's the binary action of engaging with the screen or with the canvas or whatever. We've now replaced that, with, that we replaced, we closed it with blinking, and now we've replaced it with thinking. So now what we've done is with a cheap sweatband or in the brim of a hat, We've put um, EEG sensors, and now Tempt just have to, or the, where we're taking this now is if he, it, it replaces Blink with Think. And we're, thanks. So we launched that at the Barbican Museum in London uh, two and a half, three weeks ago. And again, it's super early stages. And then this headline came out. And, we, and, and, and if any of y'all have kids and you've seen Puss in Boots, ooh. So we're like, uh-oh. Them's going to be mad. 
Um, so that's kind of the work that we're doing. And, the, and I think the most fun thing about this is that what we have right now is rudimentary, but we just broke the four minute mile, right? And what's gonna happen in the weeks to come? One of my favorite emails I ever got, I got an email in, on a cold December morning, cold in Venice Beach terms, uh, <laughs> from this group in Korea that said, oh, Mr. Ebling, you know, compliment, compliment, saw your TED talk, compliment, compliment, you're so brilliant, compliment, compliment. Last line, we just made a device that kicks your device's ass. <laughs> Compliment, compliment, sincerely, right? <laughs> and I was like, perfect, that's what we want. We're not precious about this. We're not precious about any of this. We want it, our whole goal is accessibility, right? We just want people to have, and all the stuff that we're making right now is more of that, ooh, but we, what we want is that the companies that are making these things to be forced into a situation to make it better, faster, cheaper, and more accessible. So, um, so the next project, so that's the, that's the whole thing that got me into this, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, as Joseph was talking about, Project Daniel. So um, I'm gonna fly through this, because I'm going long, because I have no concept of time. I have no concept of time. So I'm gonna go really fast. So Project Daniel. Project Daniel happened, uh, like most things, over a glass of wine with a friend, and, and he told me about this doctor named Dr. Tom Katana. And Dr. Tom is located in this region in the Nuba Mountains, which is this region between Sudan and South Sudan. And Dr. Tom pretty much does everything. He's the only hospital within a 1,500 mile radius. He delivers babies, he inoculates, he pulls teeth, you name it, he does it. And I went home and read an article about him after this, and the article was in time and it talked about his work and talked about what he did, but it also talked about a young boy named Daniel. And what happens right now in the Nuba Mountains is the government of Sudan, the same government that is responsible for the atrocities in Darfur, uh, regularly commits bombing missions and bombing runs on the civilian population. From a military strategy, you bomb civilians, they leave. When you come in, you don't have to fight. That's kind of what they do. So they drop these, bomb, these, these very crude Molotov cocktail bombs out of the back of the planes. The civilians that live in the area hear them coming a mile away, and they just they get into foxholes. There's foxholes everywhere. So if you can get into a foxhole, you're OK. But if you can't, you're not OK. So Daniel heard it, he was out tending his family's goats, he heard it coming, he hid behind a tree, he wrapped his arms around a tree, the bomb blew up and blew his arms off, but the tree saved his body. So Dr. Tom amputated uh, his arms, and when Daniel woke up and saw that both of his arms were gone, he said, if I could have died, I would have, because now I'm gonna be such a burden to my family. I have three little boys. I'm sitting there at my laptop, got a glass of water, 11, 11.30 at night, and I'm looking down the hallway at my kitchen table where my little boys sleep, and I couldn't imagine if they had that sense of despair, that they were worried about me and the burden that they were gonna cause to me because of something that happened to them. So, start the process. Gotta do something. So, again, the dinner table rule, right? Invited a bunch of brilliant people to my house. We moved everything to the side, and we started playing around with the concept of 3D prosthetics and, and handmade prosthetics, and we played with wood, and we played with lots of things. And this is a guy in South Africa named Richard Van Oss who created probably the most popular 3D prosthetic called the RoboHand, and I flew to his house in South Africa en route to Sudan, not knowing what the hell I was gonna do when I got to Sudan if what I did was, with Richard failed because I had no idea what I was gonna do. Um, and he taught me how to, how, what he was doing, and we played with different ways, and he taught me how to work with amputees and how to work with, you know, just the, the printing process. And I slept, for the, now it was reciprocated, I slept on his floor and ate his food for a week. And I hopped a plane and flew to Sudan and landed in Sudan and landed in Yida refugee camp. And Yida is called by the UN as the most challenging refugee camp in the world. And this is what it looks like, so you can kind of see why it gave this beginning of that name. And, uh, and this is what I landed to uh, at the runway. And I went and met Daniel for the first time, which was a miracle in of itself because it's a 70,000 person refugee camp with no infrastructure, no communication. And the group, Dr. Tom's group was able to find Daniel, which was just like, that was a needle in a haystack. Um, and I went and met him. This was the first time I met him. And that's kind of what he looked like. And he was kind of forlorn and looked away. And uh, the problem was is that while I was in the air flying from South Africa to Sudan, the ceasefire ended. So now we're now in an active war zone. 
So we piled up all our stuff. I had 3D printers and laptops, and we piled up all our stuff, and we're getting ready to drive to Dr. Tom's, and security set came in and said, sorry, you're not going anywhere. And I'm like, no, I'm going. And they're like, I don't care, Mr. Hollywood, who, what you think. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, D so we said, we got to do something. So, uh, and this is kind of what the refugee camp turned into. It turned into refugees to soldiers almost overnight. So uh, we got an NGO to donate a little shed for us over here, and we just started making. We set up the printers, and we just started figuring out how we were going to do this. And we went through the process and sat with Daniel and started experimenting with the arms and started experimenting with how we were going to get this done. I got a chance to see Daniel and how Daniel existed, how he was fed by his friend Shaki, how he was able to, and Shaki, talk about like the truest, truest form of unselfish love. That little boy named Shaki did everything for Daniel. He, and I found out afterwards, he, he was told me he was his brother. He's not his brother. He was a friend. I've got three kids. I lose patience with them on a, you can measure it by the minute. And Shockey didn't lose patience with, with Daniel for, for one time, the entire time I saw him. And so if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. The electricity was wrong. The, um, the, the printer was so hot. The, the outside surroundings were so hot that it melted the, the plastic to itself. So we started to print at night. We printed at night. We basically went and showed up the next day. We're like, all right, it's going to be done because it was cool enough. And there were prehistoric moths that had lodged themselves in our printer motor that jammed up our printer. So we had to extract that. And we just kept going. And this is actually what uh, a 3D printed hand looks like in the printing process. Um, but we just had to keep going. And, and um, what we ended up doing is, it, you know, it's hard to t tell the little boy next to you who's looking at you the entire time, sorry, man, the printer's not working. I don't think we're going to be able to pull this off. You know, you're like, no, you're going to pull this off. There's no question about it. So, and this is a, a quick time lapse of, of what it takes to, to build the arm. So at the end of these six days that we were there, this happened. There's this thing in me that loves to see things that are supposed to not be done, be done. Daniel is just one of 50,000 amputees left in the wake of the bloodiest war Africa has ever known. We flew into an active war zone in Sudan with 3D printers, laptops, spools of plastic, and the goal to build Daniel an arm. You ready? The concept of Project Daniel was hatched on July 11th. And on November 11th, Daniel fed himself for the first time in two years. But it's never about just one person. If we could teach the locals to do it themselves, then Project Daniel could live on long after we left. And it did. So that, that's Project Daniel. Um, and the, our, our mission, and you kind of sit out there at the, at the end, was not to be what, uh, any South Park fans here? You guys ever imagine that kind of the Sally Struthers episode of South Park? You can kind of fill in the blanks what that's about, you know? We didn't want to be that, right? We didn't want to be the UN food drop that drops and then leaves, and then when the food runs out, you're out of luck. So what we wanted to do was actually to go in and teach the locals how to make the prosthetics arms themselves. So Dr. Tom assembled a group of young men I had, my time was cut down to about five days, but we broke them into two groups, and by the time I left, the very night that I was leaving the next day, they ended up making an arm for Daniel and an arm for Muhammad. So I'm fired up, I'm like, this is awesome, this is great, but there's this little tiny thing in me that's like, holy crap, what happens if they, 
What happens if the teacher leaves and they can't do it anymore? So I hopped the flight to come back to LA and it was about a four day journey to get back and I landed and flipped on my phone and Dr. Tom said, hey, hope the flight wasn't too grueling. It was similar to the flight last night actually. Uh, but while you're in the air, they made two arms. And so I'm walking through LAX, just like this, like jumping up and down. And everyone's like, wait a second, what's this guy all about? And so they made two arms while they were there. And that was for us, that was kind of the true sign of success around this. And what I learned about this whole experience is that, is that, is to reinvent the model of doing good. The way I'm going about this right now is not to go around conventionally to do this. I'm trying to create something that is sustainable. And that's why we created Not Impossible Labs as a for-profit venture and not a non, we have a non-profit arm as well, but we have a for-profit arm because in our opinion, if we can figure out how to do this in a sustainable way, we're not gonna get carpal tunnels with our tin cup constantly begging for money. We'll create something that can constantly be working and constantly be going and at the end of the day, I want the results. I don't want a 501c3 status. If I, no, I don't care what status I have. If I can do the results, then that's what I want. Um, and this is a quote from Buckminster Fuller that really empowers us around there, which is, you don't change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the entire model, existing model, obsolete. Um, and the lesson two is the power of story. You saw, that, you saw the arm of Daniel, right? That, wasn't, that was far from pretty. And you saw the eye writer, far from pretty. But it's the story around what we were doing that's going to empower the next team that's going to be like that email that says, compliment, compliment, we made, yours we made ours better. We want to get more of those emails. We want people, the quicker we get this out into the marketplace, the quicker people can make these better, and it can improve upon itself. And the, so the question, I think, that's asked, especially when we go to the brands, like Intel, Intel and Press Apart funded that, and we're talking to Microsoft and G and all these companies, is, is their, their questions are, well, what is our story? Like, how, how are we gonna affiliate with the story that you're telling? And my thing is, yes, it's the power of the story, but don't think of it from the standpoint of the story, because saying the story is kind of like saying hunger. The question that you wanna ask yourself, and the question I would say that everybody in this room wants to ask yourself, because the way that true global change happens is an in, through an individual perspective, right? is not to ask, what is your story? But to ask, who is your Daniel? Who is the Daniel in your life that you walk by, that you read about? But who is that singular being, that singular entity? By going after and trying to help that person and solve that person's issue, and then giving it away, and then spreading that, then you talk about true global change. Then you talk about a revolution. And that's how you help one help many. Thank you guys very much. Ah, thank you. That's cool, brother. Thanks, I man. love that, man. Thank so you. beautiful. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Do we have time for some questions? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, gang, thank you so much. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. We got five minutes for Q&A, so uh, I'll let Mick handle his own Q&A, but I am going to keep you to five minutes so we can get the next thing rolling. All thank right, you. Perfect. All right, this is the fun part. Questions? Yeah. What's next? Oh, so glad you asked that. <laughs> Will you cue the slides, please, maestro? <laughs> I'll give you your 20 after this. Thanks for queuing that up. Um, <clears throat> we're doing right now, we're doing Global Labs, we're taking what we learned from Project Daniel, and we're now going to go around the world, and in two years we're going to put in 15 labs that have 3D printers, laptops, but we're also going to take what we're calling tools of civilization, kind of rudimentary brick making machines, rudimentary um, automated plows, things like that can, that can totally revolutionize a civilization. Um, and we're gonna do that in countries that actually came to us, that, that, that concept of telling the story. They found out about Project Daniel and they came to us. So we're going to Vietnam, we're going to Tanzania, we're going to Sierra Leone, we're going to Nicaragua. And then the, the fun thing about this is now, if I asked everyone in this room to come up with an idea, it would be culturally relevant to this room. So it would be people who live in Aspen, and so it would probably be something about, I'm going to be really stereotypical, mountain biking or hiking right, or something like that. But it's relevant to you. When you talk about Haiti and Nicaragua and Vietnam and Cambodia, you have the ability to share information. So what I'm super excited about is that something that comes out of Haiti is going to totally be relevant 
for Cambodia, and then they're going to shift it five degrees, and it's going to relate to Sierra Leone, and they're going to shift it 10 degrees, and it's going to relate down to Chile. And so you're going to have this kind of this constant like effort, uh, always flowing kind of source of these devices and things that are going to be made that can revolutionize the society. Um, the Brain Rider, I talked about. Um, uh, I'll show you this other one. This one's super exciting. Uh, so I went to a, uh, and this is actually, this is relevant to the talk with Amanda later today, that um, I went to a, the largest rehabilitation hospital in Mexico City. I got this incredible tour. At the end of the tour, they showed me this room, and it was this little girl on this thing, and she's got cerebral palsy. And this machine is basically teaching her brain to speak to her legs again, right? So it walks for her, and then like a DJ, you kind of peel it back, and eventually she can walk on her own. Well, we're now, I asked the guy, I'm like, why don't you have more of these things? And he said, they're too expensive. And I went, really? <laughs> He said, yeah, and the funny thing is if a kid uses this, they can walk in one year. If a kid doesn't use this, it could take five years. And I said, let's just say, or the commit thing, let's just say I could do it for under 100 grand. And he goes, I'd buy 20 of them from you right now. So we have a tool that we're making right now, and our primary team, we, brought, we built a team of kind of PhDs, a bunch of smart guys, but the people who are driving it the hardest is the Granada Hills High School robotics team. And they're, they're killing it. They are making all of the guys with initials behind their names look like a bunch of slow pokes. <laughs> they're killing it. It's, it's awesome. So, those are some of the things we're doing. Yeah.